Kidney Warriors. James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach, and this is Dadvice TV Live. Now, for all of you who are joining us for the very first time, welcome. It is great to have you here. You're going to find Dadvice TV is very supportive, positive, and we are just full of all sorts of information from industry professionals, such as my co-host today. My co-host is from a website called Plant Powered Kidneys, which also has an amazing Facebook group, and I'll let my, my uh, co-host talk about that in a second. Please welcome PlantPoweredKidneys.com, renal dietitian, Jen Hernandez. Hey, Jen. Hi, James. Hi, everybody. I am, as always, so happy to be back and thrilled to chat with you all tonight. We're going to do a Q&A for kidney nutrition. Before we dive into all of that, I definitely need to bring up our free Facebook group that James mentioned. We do have a Facebook group. You can search Plant Powered Kidneys and you can join. It's over 9,000 people in this group already. And it's just a really supportive and positive group that shares food and recipes and support and wins and successes and all kinds of good things. So if you're looking for a supportive community, I 100% encourage you to join our free group. Anybody can join. You just have to answer the questions that we have because we do help make sure that we keep bots and, and people out. We do, or we're very protective of our group, but you answer the questions, you get in right away and you can start connecting with the thousands of other people in the group who want to protect their kidney health. And then a little bit about me. Uh, I am a renal dietitian. So I am a registered dietitian that's also certified in renal nutrition. And I have spent my dietetic career focused on helping people with kidney disease. A lot of that was in the dialysis clinics, but I've also spent time in with the Kidney Foundation and helping CKD. And all of it really led to the birth of Plant Powered Kidneys, where we provide information and support and knowledge for people who are in earlier stages of kidney disease that want to prevent or delay this theory, this concept of ending up on dialysis, which really at this point is just a concept because not everybody automatically goes on dialysis just because you have kidney disease. We teach you how to eat better foods to support your kidney health and keep your kidneys functioning as best as possible. And I will tell you, there are so many opportunities available. You just need to take the time to invest into learning about what to do and start to prioritize those things. So if you wanna learn more about that, definitely check us out at plantpoweredkidneys.com. And if you wanna learn more about our course, you can go sign up at the course waitlist, which we will let you know by email once the doors are open yep and there's links to jen's facebook group her website and all that down in the video description so when we're done with our live q a you can go down there one click boom join that facebook group and i'll tell you my favorite thing in the facebook group besides the positivity of all the people are the photos of their meals it Right. We're always wondering, what can we eat? I'm getting bored eating the same thing. There is so much creativity there. People giving each other ideas. And they're saying, hey, here's what I made. Here's how I adjusted it for my own personal labs. Gives you a lot of great tips, advice, and ideas to just run with and make eating something you look forward to and that you really enjoy. Yeah, yeah. I was actually just talking with a group earlier today about the stress that can come with figuring out all of this stuff. And it's not like, you know, Joe Schmo who just needs to figure out how to put food on the plate. It's like, well, how do I do it when I have to protect my kidneys and I have to think about my heart and I have to think about my blood pressure and I have to think about diabetes and like all these other things. It can really be a lot. And that simple concept of just eat a meal doesn't always feel so simple. It feels like it can be a lot. But when you do have more of that understanding and knowledge and support and ideas, it can help it feel a little bit better. And the more you practice that, the more you utilize those tools and, and that support, the easier it can get. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll tell you, I feel comfortable going to any restaurant. I can look at the menu and figure out, okay, Here's what I should do. Hold this. Don't put that on there. I'll order this. 
in the beginning, I was scared to death. What in the world can I eat? Even just going to a grocery store with everything available. Mm -hmm. But let's go ahead and jump into the live questions. We've already got people asking questions. Guys, this is a live show. Um, at least right now at the taping, it is April 1st or April 4th. 4th. April 4th. It's the 4th. It's the 4th, everyone. I don't want to lose those days of work I just work, I went through. <laughs> April 4th, it's just after 7 p.m. Eastern here in the United States. If you have a question, write it down in the comments. Um, and if you have a suggestion or an idea for somebody else who posted a question, feel free to, to chat there in the comments. Jen and I can see everything you guys type. And like Rob here just posted something. I, I'll click them. I'll bring them up here on the screen. And we will try to answer as many questions as we can. Now, Jen and I are not your doctor, so we can't prescribe anything, but Jen can speak about nutrition and what's, you know, kind of a general level answering mm -hmm. questions that you have. She's full of a ton of information, tons more on her website, plantpoweredkidneys.com. And if anyone has any questions about my experience with kidney disease, I'll chime in. Um, I'm going to try to let Jen answer as many of these as possible because I can click a button and be back online again to chat with all of you. We have Jen here for a short amount of time. So I'm gonna let you guys monopolize it as much as possible. <laughs> so you get the most out of her. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited for these questions. I see we already have some jumping in here. Yeah, is there any that you wanna start with and I'll bring them up? We've got um, so well, Greg jumped in really early right away with a question about stage four kidney disease and potassium. Yeah, yep. there we go. Um, so with someone who has stage four CKD, at what point is it determined that potassium intake should be reduced? Now, don't hate me. <laughs> so <laughs> because I'm going to say one of these things that people are like, oh, that's not even an answer. But it really, really comes down to the individual. It comes down mm -hmm. to your labs. And that's why I know, James, you talk about labs a lot. I talk about labs yep. all the time. I have I mean, I just got a new client started. Um, starting tomorrow and I got 30 pages of labs to go over with, with them tomorrow because there's a lot to dive into, mm -hmm. but it really depends on your labs. And the, the thing that we need to look at is in these different stages. So if we're talking about stage four, you're in the, the later stages of kidney disease, but it's not end stage. You still have kidney function available. So it's still taking care of some potassium. Mm -hmm. The question is going to be how much of that potassium is being taken care of. So are your labs showing that your potassium level is managed? In the cases that the kidneys can't keep up with the potassium, those levels kind of start to creep up. And this is more so in stage four and stage five. Sometimes in stage four, sometimes in stage five, sometimes in dialysis, but we can't, we never look at a certain stage and say, oh, you have, you know, stage three or you have stage four, you have a potassium restriction. Like, we can't do that just by looking at you. We have to look at the labs. And as a dietitian, what I do with my clients is we look at your intake. So we look at how much you're logging in something like chronometer or in a in my fitness pal or whatever kind of food journal that you use to see how much potassium you're actually consuming. And that helps us. That's one part of determining what your potassium balance should be. But there's other factors that don't relate to how much potassium we eat. There's also factors like our constipation, our gut health, how well our gut is taking care of potassium by moving things through. There's also potential for like any muscle breakdown or any shifts in that, which could also release potassium from cells or diabetes control, blood sugar management. If your blood sugars aren't well controlled, that can also impact your potassium level. And if you have metabolic acidosis, this is very common for kidney disease, but that can also shift potassium in and out of the cell could cause a higher potassium level too. So this is a really long winded answer to not really get any direct answer of yes or no, or this is when, but really for you to understand talking more with your healthcare team, talking with your doctor about, you know, always opening up that conversation when you see them, because it should always be assessed. You should always be discussing it. And if or when that point ever comes where they do start talking with you about a potassium restriction, 
jump on the chance to talk with the dietitian because I tell you, the doctor is only going to have so much time to get into those details, but a dietitian will dedicate their entire session with you to talk with you about your potassium, about your levels, about the foods you should eat, all the things that you need to know about your potassium. So if a doctor is saying you're on a potassium restriction, say, okay, can I please have a, a referral to a dietitian so that you can see someone who can dive into this further? Yeah, and don't assume that just because, you know, people in a, in a group online are saying, hey, you know, your GFR is 25, you need to be on a potassium restriction. That is not accurate. Um, when I was diagnosed with kidney failure, GFR 8, I it said critically low for, for my potassium. can't remember what the number was, but it was extremely low. And they gave me IVs of potassium, and it burned my arm and my shoulder my potassium was difficult to keep up for such a long time. Then once we got my blood pressure under control, some of that medication causes me to hold on to potassium. Then it started getting high and I had to deal with it being high and just adjusting what I eat. So using your own labs as your guide is by far the right thing to do. And your doctor, your dietitian will tell you when it's time for you to be on any type of restriction, potassium, water, anything. They will Phosphorus, be the ones to protein. let you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And another thing that you mentioned about the higher potassium, I have very, very often had to encourage clients to eat more potassium because they were restricting too much and it was actually damaging their kidneys more than it was because they weren't taking in this very important nutrient that protects our kidneys. So our keep heart. in mind- yeah, exactly. So so keep in mind, just the idea of restricting something like potassium doesn't mean that that's automatically going to protect your kidneys. Yep. All right. Next question. Okay. Um, I think we can quickly answer this one. How much dosage of vitamin E for stage five? So there really is no dosage for vitamin E for stage five in this very specific question, but in a more general sense, vitamin E is a fat soluble vitamin. What this means is our body actually holds on to the vitamin stores. And so we can have too much of this vitamin in our body. Now with the kidneys helping to filter things out and help manage a lot of nutrients, people with CKD are at a higher risk of vitamin toxicity of the fat soluble vitamins. And this includes vitamin E. It also includes vitamin A, vitamin K and vitamin D. These are fat soluble vitamins. And that's another reason why even with CKD, not everybody should be on a vitamin D supplement because if you have too much, it can be really harmful for your health. So if you're looking at a vitamin supplement, the first thing, again, I'm going to point you back to your provider to talk with them more about is this supplement something you should be taking? If is it going to be safe for you? And if you have somebody recommending it to you, a provider, they should be giving you a recommended dosage of what you should be doing and tracking that progress. Because if you're having a supplement like that, what type of result are you looking for? Do you need to see a certain lab value improve? Are you looking at a different metric or the anti-inflammatory metrics like to, because vitamin E is an antioxidant? So what, what exactly is the end game for it? Basically, what's the point of the supplement? Why are we taking this and talking with your provider more about that will give you more answers about maybe other opportunities that could be safer for you. And you and I did an entire video all about fat soluble and vitamin D um, vitamins. It is video number 156. If you guys go to dadvicetv.com, there's a search. You can either search for 156 and that video will come right up or you can search for uh, vitamins and watch that video to learn even more about all those different vitamins. Yeah, we definitely talked a lot about vitamins. I know our articles are pretty comprehensive on that. Yeah. Here, I'm going to bring one up because I know we've had a few people asking about this. Philip just posted it. How about vitamin D with K2, which is something that I take by order of my doctor? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, hi, Philip. <laughs> I recognize that name. So, okay. Well, the, the vitamin D... Three and K2 can be a really great combination 
because vitamin D3 is better absorbed and utilized in the body and vitamin K2 is like its best friend. It pairs really, really well with it. So vitamin D3, what it helps to do is bring more calcium into the body because that is basic. Well, it's one of the big rules for it. So we're bringing this calcium in and then the K2 tells the calcium where to go basically. So this is a really good partnership to prevent a well, I wouldn't say common, but a potential issue of hypercalcemia, too much calcium in the blood, um, because the K2 is helping to get it to the bones. That doesn't guarantee that it, hypercalcemia won't happen, which is again, another reason that you want to have your supplements reviewed and approved by a provider because vitamin D is another one that there's a lot, a, a very wide range of doses and so you want to make sure you're taking the right amount to support whatever that goal, whatever goal that is that you have. So most often it's because of a low vitamin D deficiency or just kind of being on the lower end. So talking with the provider, how much should I be taking and when are we going to test my vitamin D levels again? That's the big thing. You, you don't want to just keep taking the same supplement forever and ever and not get your levels checked because that's good. That's going to be what tells us if we need to adjust the dose. So I've had some patients who come to me with a really, really low vitamin D. We get them on a loaded dose. We get them up there for maybe like a higher dose, and then they get retested and say their vitamin D level is a bit more improved. And then we bring it back down to more of a maintenance dose to keep them at that level. So the dose changes from start to middle to end. And then even then when we're at the end, that still needs to be checked. Vitamin D typically is great to be checked twice a year. I think of it like checking around daylight savings time because there's a big shift in when we get sun exposure. And so that can help assess if we're on the right course of vitamin D. So um, that's that's what I would recommend. It is a very, it is probably one of the more most common supplements for CKD, but it doesn't mean it's for everyone because there is such a thing as too high of a vitamin D level. Excuse me, level. And vitamin D, it's, it's it's easy to rapidly rise to raise it, but it takes a long time for it to start coming down. Mm -hmm. If you take too much too long and you've gotten too high, mine got too high. I think it was 131 or 135, which was way higher than they wanted. Mm -hmm. um, they wanted me around 100 on the lab and it took it took like maybe two, two and a half months of me eliminating the supplement for it yeah. to get back down to where they wanted it. And they're like, okay, now we're going to start you on a smaller dose just to keep it there. Exactly. Exactly. It shows how important it is to have that follow-up and that communication and those, those kind of periodic checks. All right. We got a bunch more questions. Keep them coming in everybody. Okay. Um, so Rob has a question. Uh, it says for someone who is 3A, can a limited amount of fish, chicken, and red meat still be eaten? If so, how much would be okay? Uh, this is another really fantastic question. So people in stage 3 CKD, 3A, 3B, there can be a lot of confusion because a lot of the information out there on the internet is not aimed at you. It's aimed at people on dialysis. And that can be really, really confusing because a lot of those articles talk about protein, protein, protein eat all of this meat, and that's not really the case. People in stage three don't generally have a protein restriction. You always want to talk with your provider about this, though, just to get crystal clear on your situation. But generally, it's not necessary. However, in this early stage of CKD, having minimal or less animal protein and more plant protein can be really powerful. Yes, really powerful in protecting your kidney health. And that's because of the products that come from plant versus animal proteins. Animal proteins are a bit more acidic. They can be harder on the kidneys because of that. They have more saturated fat, whereas plant proteins have more phytonutrients. It has more fiber. It has more micronutrients. It still has the protein. The digestibility isn't quite as high, so it makes it easier for the kidneys to be dealing with. There's a lot of benefits there, but you can kind of change this. Think of it like a ratio of your animal and plant protein. As long as you're focusing on more of the plants compared to the animals, you're probably going to be winning. 
you're probably going to be doing a good job. It's when we start shifting with too much animal protein and not enough plant protein that can make it a little bit more challenging for the kidneys to keep doing what they're doing. And you might not see the lab results that you really wanted to. So keep that in mind. Um, another thing too is uh, you don't necessarily have to eliminate all animal meat. This is again, something I was just talking about with some students today that you, we're, we're plant powered kidneys because we promote plants, but we're not necessarily saying vegan. We're not vegan kidneys. We're plant powered kidneys because we're using the power of plants to help preserve kidney function. And as long as you're including a lot of plants in your diet, you're on the right track. So having a little bit of animal meats or animal proteins or animal foods isn't necessarily going to break the bank for you as long as you're providing it with so much greens and reds and oranges and all those beautiful plant colors that we have that we can add to our diet. Yeah, and I like to start my my dinner off with plants first. What are the fruits and vegetables I'm going to eat? And then I add like some chicken or something to that if it's not enough. Um, and that's just a shift that I've made and it made it so much easier to eat healthy. Mm -hmm. Um, I just need to, I need to do that when I snack. That's my, that's my weakness. That's my kryptonite carbs <laughs> and snacking. <laughs> I need to keep more fruits and vegetables around to snack on those. Yeah. Those like pre-cut ones. I mean, they yeah. can be kind of expensive, but if they're not going to go to waste and if they're right there and ready to go, sometimes they're worth it. Here's the problem. We buy those things all the time. Platters are the big things of the chopped fruit. It doesn't last because all of us in the house gobble it all down. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we need a we big such a great just game. for that. Yeah. I mean, that's so cool, though, to, to say like, oh, you know, my family loves fruits and vegetables so much. We can't keep them around the house. Yeah. That's got to start growing a garden. <laughs> we got too many deer. <laughs> All right, what's our next great question? That was a great one for Rob. And 3A is such a fantastic time to start looking at diet and lifestyle. Yeah. Um, to start eating more heart healthy. Um, if you eat heart healthy, it's going to be kidney friendly, uh, especially at 3A. Um, and that's mm -hmm. what we want to do. We want to protect our heart because kidney disease is, you know, for those that are new, kidney disease is a huge risk factor for heart disease, that's going to be the thing that's going to get you. It's going to be a stroke, heart attack, clogged arteries. So uh, at 3A, start thinking heart healthy, being active more, drinking more water and no sodas and eating more plant-based and healthier foods. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's see what else do we have here. Someone asked um, me, James. What do you snack on when you cheat? Oh, my God. So you go to the store and you think, oh, that's healthy. It's a cracker. I'll get some crackers. No, they're just loaded with stuff. I am fantastic at not getting too much sodium. I've got that down. I do, do not want my blood pressure to get high because I know how dangerous that is for my kidneys. But... This all sorts of snacks, like animal crackers that come in a little box. Um, the the snacks my kids get that they bring home. I'm not eating candy bars or anything like that, but it, anything with a carb. And I sit all day for work. <laughs> you know? um, someone says, what about ice cream? Oh, my goodness. Luckily, we like don't. In, like in general, what about ice cream? Or yeah, for, for Sandra. How about ice cream on a renal diet? I do not eat ice cream only because my kids would just, I would come home and it would be all empty tubs and they'd be like, oh, dad, my tummy's upset. So we <laughs> don't keep ice cream in the house. But what about ice cream on a renal diet? Well, I think there's a, a lot of good options that are available. If we can like expand to like frozen treats, I think there's plenty of things. Ice cream, if we're talking about like just your standard traditional ice cream, as a dairy product, it's going to be a little bit higher in phosphorus and potassium. Uh, the phosphorus is going to be a little more highly absorbed compared to like other uh, 
like sorbet products or things like that because dairy has that mid range of phosphorus absorption so there's that to consider um, if you have high phosphorus issues that might be something might be something to look at switching for an alternative but they have a lot of great like frozen fruit bars i love the outshine coconut bars those are so good to me. I know coconut's really like a hit or miss kind of a thing, but it's a hit for me. So uh, the, the coconut bars, I think are really, really great. Um, they have a lot of good sorbet options. I mean, like a lemon sorbet is so refreshing and we're starting to get into the warmer weather. So these are good things to kind of be thinking about and planning for to have good options that you feel good about and that you enjoy. And it kind of just balances all of that out because if you're on either side of the scale too much either it's something that you really really don't you really know you shouldn't be having so you feel so guilty about it or if it's super healthy and you're just like not enjoying it at all like either sides of those aren't really going to be sustainable so looking down the middle like what's something that you enjoy that you're not going to feel terrible about but still feel satisfying to you finding those kinds of treats can be really helpful so looking at ice cream look at some of the ones that you just feel that are really, really enjoyable for you. And you're not going to feel terribly guilty about because yes, it could be part of your diet as long as you feel comfortable about it and you enjoy it. Yeah. And you've taught me several great desserts. I love the one where I put the wax paper down, the yogurt, and you throw like the fruit. I buy the frozen fruit, the raspberries, blueberries. I've even started adding blackberries in there. I hated blackberries. I lived in Seattle and they grew everywhere. So they were like a weed with thorns and I hated them, but I do like the flavor because they're very powerful, but you put those in there, freeze it, crack it up. Oh, it is a great alternative. It's not a substitute, but a great alternative to a frozen snack. Yeah. I, oh, it's so good. I love it with uh, cherries, putting yes, cherries I'm, on top. Yeah, yes. Black cherries. Oh, so good. Yeah. And someone had mentioned unsalted popcorn or putting some seasoning on the popcorn. Another great snack idea. Even the low sodium, there's a lot of uh, the microwave popcorns that are out now that are, are pretty good in salt. They're, they're not terribly high. The ones that are pre-popped, like in the big bags next to the chips or the ones that are microwaved. I mean, it just takes some time to go through the grocery store and just practice looking the labels, looking at those things like sodium and the ingredients, and then finding your go-tos. That way you can go back and just grab them more easily. You do want to periodically check those labels because they might add something in there from time to time that isn't great, but you won't necessarily always have to do that. Um, but, but taking that time initially to just learn and understand what you're looking for can be really helpful. Now here's a question I want to answer real quick. The prophet is getting ready for a colonoscopy and they hear the anesthesia may be bad for the kidneys. So let me tell you, I just, just, had this conversation with my doctor because I kept putting off my colonoscopy. I've got, here's my referral sheet right here. Huh? <laughs> She's like, you go get it now within three months. Um, I asked the same question, no concerns. Um, but when you go in and they use like the dyes for the other types of tests, the, um, oh, I can't remember what it's called. Those ones can be a problem because they're giving you mm -hmm. things that you end up going through your kidneys. Um, high contrast dyes. Those are definitely not good for those with kidneys. Um, we got someone who's recently on. They said, "Jenner, you're a renal dietitian." Yes, she is. She's an awesome, yeah, awesome I am. Renal dietitian <laughs> has an amazing team at Plant Powered Kidneys of other dietitians that can help people. They come on here. We've been doing videos for years now, and these live Q and A sessions are fantastic. So, so yeah. Leanne, if you have any questions. Type them in real quick for Jim. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me see there. Yeah, there's a lot of questions coming in now that I'm trying to go through. Um, <laughs> there was one asking about, and I'll, I'll try to at least answer some really quickly. Um, my mom has CKD4 and is also anemic and low in calcium. Any kidney friendly options to suggest? Um, a quick few points on that. So stage four is a time where anemia might start to be a problem. So eating foods that are rich in iron and pairing those with sources of vitamin C is helpful to absorb the iron. And it's interesting you mentioned the low in calcium because calcium, if your mom takes a calcium supplement, which you definitely want to run by mom's doctor because calcium supplements are not always advised for CKD, but in this event, 
you would want to take the calcium supplement separate from any iron supplement because a calcium supplement inhibits absorption of iron. So if you took the calcium supplement with like an iron rich meal, it wouldn't absorb the iron that you just ate. Um, we do have an article about iron rich foods on our blog. You can just go to plant powered kidneys and search iron rich foods. And we have a free download of a whole list of iron rich foods. And we have an article about iron water, which sounds super weird, but where is it? Wait, I have not heard about that. Ha, huh. okay. And my camera is now gonna be, um, yeah. Okay, I should have gone out. So. Iron water. Yeah. Ooh, we have an article on plant powered kidneys about how to make it. And it's using this, whoop. I still have like all the little things in here. It's using <gasps> the this little tool. And this is called the Lucky Iron Leaf. They also oh, have the Lucky Iron Fish. So it's about the size of my palm, a little bit smaller. And you put this in boiling water and it infuses iron into the water. And then you add a few drops of citrus, a few drops of lemon or something like that so that it helps with the iron to get into the um, get into the water. And you can drink that as an iron beverage. So add it to just drink, just make it your drinking water. You can use it in your soups and your stews. You can use the water in cooking. You can put this directly in a recipe. You can put this in something that has a lot of liquid to it and it will infuse with iron. So this can be really, really a cool trick. It's reusable. You just wanna make sure you wash it and take care of it after you use it. Um, but it's made of like a cast iron material. So cast iron pans have the same kind of concept that they will add iron to food. But this little tool is super, super cool. And in the iron water article, I believe I have a link for it. So you can go check it out there. Um, but yeah, it's a great it's a great way to add iron to the food without more of supplements. Some people do still require supplementation, like an oral pill or an IV iron injection, um, but that will come from an order from your pr uh, provider. Very good. I learn something every time we we chat. <laughs> every one I have on here, I learn <laughs> new things every single time, which is great. I've heard of the yeah. iron fish and I still use cast iron pots to help get a little more iron into my food because mm -hmm. stir fry is the, the one thing I learned how to make and I've stuck with it. Now that I'm settled down in Michigan, I got to start expanding my, my cooking abilities. But there so you much go. You can do with stir fry. It's easy to throw lots of vegetables in there, make up a little sauce and, it, it can taste amazing. And, yeah. I, and I would recommend that if someone had a question, Dustin didn't grow up eating fruits and vegetables, some suggestions to help him. That's mine. Look at stir fries where you can mix things up, get some different flavors in there. Uh, there's a lot you can do for it. Any suggestions you would have for Dustin to help him start getting used to fruits and vegetables and enjoying yeah. it? Yeah. I mean, a really great, easy trick is to roast a bunch of vegetables like some tomatoes onions garlic um peppers like bell peppers roast it all together and then blend it up and make a nice sauce and then you have a really heavy veggie sauce toss it with some pasta you know add a little bit of seasoning like salt and pepper oregano maybe um some red some crushed red pepper flakes if you like spice um but adding something like that can be really great for fruits, it's smoothies, you know, making smoothies and adding that, that can be really, really easy. I think you're focusing more on vegetables and that's what I commonly hear. Um, and another thing that James, even you and I have talked about is when you go out to restaurants, try ordering more meals that are vegetarian or vegan that have more plants in them. So you can kind of get an experience of what it can taste like. And then as you start to develop more of a taste for it, you start practicing more, I mean, cooking, it, it's its like any other skill. Practice makes perfect. And it's just a matter of continuing to practice and try things and experiment. Be willing to try something. Acknowledge that it may not have tasted good then, but it may taste good in a different recipe at a different time. So uh, it, it can take quite a few times for us to taste something and really enjoy it. And it 
often comes down to how we prepared it, the flavors that we use for it, the sauces, the spices, all of that. So play around with different flavors to see what you enjoy. And that's something that you can use too. If there's certain spices that you already use for other foods, try putting them on vegetables. You know, instead of roasting chicken, roast some bell peppers and mushrooms and use those same spices to incorporate those same flavors. And you taught me to roast radishes, which I do all the time, the air fryer. And I cannot believe how great they, they completely change. I like yeah. radishes. I eat them like apples and they got a little, little spice bite. to them. Yeah. yeah bite. But you, you slice them up, throw them in the air fryer and roast them right in there. They are like red skin potatoes, like a great substitute for it. The, the bite goes away. They get mushy like potatoes. Mm -hmm. They are delicious as a potato substitute. And you're eating radishes. Yeah, it's, it's really cool how you can make a change to a vegetable. And it might be something that you hate when it's raw. Like, I'm really not a huge fan of raw broccoli. But there is a whole sheet pan full of broccoli roasting in my oven right now. Because I will eat roasted broccoli every single day. It is so good. And I, I just love the flavor, adding garlic powder to it. It's so good. But raw gar or raw broccoli, I'm like, mm, I get like if I do, I have to. So beets are another one. I'm not a huge fan of beets. Like they're okay, mm, but yeah. you don't have to like every single vegetable, but find what you enjoy and lean into that. Start leaning into that and adding that more to your plate or trying different dishes when you go out. Yeah, there Rachel says, roasted radishes are amazing. They yes. are. <laughs> okay, what's the next question you'd like to answer? All right, let's see what we got here. Oh, I lost my place. We got um, a lot. I know there's, we have a there's lot. so many questions, and they come in from all the different sites, too. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, um, okay. So we have one here. How many times a year should you be seen by a nephrologist if you're between stage two and stage three? I'll just, I'll answer this one really quickly. I mean, as a dietitian, there's only so much. So this could be a good question for Dr. Rowe. Um, but also in these earlier stages, it's not necessarily going to mean a nephrology referral. You might have to uh, push for that nephrology referral. And when you see the nephrologist, they probably aren't going to be hyper worried, critical focused on earlier stages because there's not a ton of medicinal interventions that are around. There are some newer ones coming up with medications to help support kidney health. And so they might start you on that and then just do like an annual or every six month appointment to check on uh, to check on things with you. But that it's not going to be as much as like somebody with CKD5 or on dialysis who sees them every single month. Mm -hmm. So um, I would just say don't stress if your doctor isn't wanting to see you, you know, more than six months at a time. All righty. Great answer there. Okay. Um, the, uh, there's another one here, how to reduce an intact PTH. So um, the parathyroid hormone of 207. So just a really quick, um, big overview about PTH, parathyroid. So PTH stands for parathyroid hormone. And this is something that our kidneys help regulate with in combination with our vitamin D levels. And so when the kidneys aren't doing so well, the communication to the PTH or to send out PTH, that can get a little confusing. And PTH also helps to balance calcium. So we start to think about PTH. We talked about calcium and vitamin D before. We also have phosphorus in the mix. And all of these things are kind of playing together. Either they're playing together nicely or they're sending alert signals to each other. But that's the thing. We want to look at the bigger picture and not just one single lab. We want to look at trends. We want to look at multiple labs. So PTH, I'm looking at your vitamin D. I'm looking at your calcium. I'm looking at your phosphorus. Of course, I'm looking at your PTH. And I want to see how these are all working together in the history. Traditionally or typically, PTH will start to increase as kidney disease progresses. And so many uh, doctors, when they're looking at this, they kind of expect a little bit of a rise and there can be some um, adjustments or accommodations based on where you're at with your kidney health. 
For somebody on dialysis, a normal PTH is between 150 to 600. But for somebody in, let's say, stage two, it's both like, I don't remember the low value, but it's around like a 65 to 85. So that's going to be like the range then, but they adjust for it in the dialysis setting because we know it's going to be higher and we expect it to be higher and we accommodate for it based off of other labs and other nutrient values. So depending on where you're at with your kidney health, 207 could be controlled and could be managed or it could be high um, if you need to reduce it. So let's say reducing it from um, earlier stages and you have the 207, again, looking at those different labs, uh, looking at your vitamin D level very importantly to see if that needs to be taken care of and probably doing some medication and supplement adjustments there. The other thing that can increase your PTH from a diet perspective is phosphorus. If you have too much phosphorus, that can trigger an increase in your PTH. So take a look at the big thing that we talk about here, which is phosphate additives. Those are those sneaky ingredients that have PHOS listed as an ingredient. So those are the kinds of things that are really highly absorbed, can increase your blood phosphate, and then can trigger that increase in PTH. So in many cases, getting that phosphorus level controlled and back down will also help control the PTH as well. Awesome. Now we've had a number of people ask about how can they reduce or lower their BUN? There's quite a few factors with BUN. Um, and this is one of the markers of, you know, kidney health and kidney function. It stands for blood urea nitrogen. This is a component of protein. So again, this also has to do with where you're at with CKD. If you're on dialysis, we do expect a higher BUN level, especially because more there's a higher protein intake with dialysis. With somebody in, let's say, stage three, it's possible to get it into the normal range. So we want to focus on good quality proteins. Again, maybe shifting for more plant protein than animal protein to help keep that reined in and then assessing how much exactly how much protein you're eating. So are you getting too much protein? If you're taking in too much and the kidneys can't handle it, it's collecting that BUN, it's breaking down the protein, it's collecting that BUN, that urea nitrogen, and it's keeping it in the body. So if you're able to assess where your protein is, this is a great time to work with the dietitian to do that full review and talk about those options because other situations like your hydration status, if you're not eating enough and it's breaking down your muscles, these things can also impact your BUN as well. So we can't just assume it's protein. It can often be related to that, especially with traditional American diets that are higher in protein. That's usually one of the first things I'm looking at, but we do want to look at other factors as well that could impact that BUN. Yeah. If I, if I get off of the plant-based and I go out, and if I'm like, oh, I'm going to have a steak right before lab, <laughs> my my BUN is up. It is up. Oh, yeah. And it's like, okay, next time I've got to get it down, I'm going to make sure. And like that that week before my labs, I'm like, no chicken. No, I'm all plant-based for my protein, for everything, and I can get it to below 30. I mean, it shows you how much of an impact the diet makes, right? Yeah. It's crazy. All righty. We're doing great on these questions. Yeah. Okay. Uh, wait, let me see. There's a lot of them. <laughs> there is. I really do appreciate you guys. I'm just taking the time to go through and <laughs> read all them. Yeah. As of right now, my thing counts how many questions have come across all the different platforms. There's over 125. So I'm busy reading. <laughs> okay. Um, and we were going to do this for 30 minutes. You see, guys, no, I, I'm just not reminding Jen what time it is. That's <laughs> all right. Until, my husband yells, until he yells at me that it's dinner time, it's okay. We're okay. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. What is a good renal calcium? Doctor said to take calcium, but didn't say which one, only dosage. Um. Okay, so 
I think it would be really good to go back to the doctor and maybe ask a little bit more questions about it. It's great that you got a dose. That's really, really important. Um, I would say looking at, there's so many options out there. I mean, I know that we have a ton at, at PPK. We have a whole dispensary of some of like supplements and things that we look at. Um, I don't commonly recommend calcium, but if your doctor is saying it, what I would look at is the ones that you have available in your stores, read the ingredient list. That's kind of my big thing because many, many supplements will include other ingredients that may or may not be good for you. So whatever you get, whatever you find that you feel comfortable with at the store, that it meets a price for you, that it really, that it has the dose that you are looking for, for your doctor, I would take it back to them and have your doctor look at the actual one and approve it. Um, just to be safe, because again, if there's something else in there that, you know, has additives or other, other uh, supplements, cause sometimes they'll kind of throw other supplements into the mix as well. And you just, you want to be safe. You never, I, I, I would hate to be taking a supplement thinking I was protecting myself only later to find out it was the wrong thing. And it was hurting my, my kidneys and my health. That's, I mean, what a waste, like the ultimate waste of money is, you know, paying for something that's not doing what it's supposed to. So whatever you find before you open it, take it to the doctor, get it checked, get it approved. It'll take them like two minutes. Um, and then you'll be good to go and you'll feel comfortable and also follow up with the doctor on what that plan's going to look like and getting your calcium checked again. Perfect. Now, Claire and uh, Sapphire have both asked if it's okay to drink coffee. And we did a whole video about coffee. We did. Yeah. Coffee is great. Coffee is life. Um, <laughs> I think, I think coffee is absolutely acceptable for a renal diet. There's a few things to consider when it comes to coffee. Like for one, it does have a temporary increase in your blood pressure. So I wouldn't down a couple cups and then go to the doctor's office to get checked because you'll have caffeine blood pressure on top, on top of white coat hypertension. So it might, might not be a fairly good reading for you. But if you consistently enjoy one to two cups a day, that can actually be healthy. And there was a recent article that came out to talk about how a low to moderate intake of caffeine can be protective of kidney health. So there's a lot of great benefits. I mean, coffee itself has antioxidants in it. So th there's benefits to the coffee. The question that usually comes up or the problem that usually comes up is what you put in the coffee. So if you're loading it up with sugar, if you're loading it up with cream, if you're loading it up with creamers, that's where you can have too much sugar. You could have too much uh, uh, saturated fat, unhealthy fat. You could have added phosphates. You could have added potassium. You could even have added sodium. And we don't really think about that when we're adding something sweet, but a lot of these things will have added salt to the creamers as well. So take a look more so at what you're putting in your coffee, and that will give you a better idea of if it's truly helping you and, and protecting your kidneys. Very good. Thanks for answering that one. Yeah. Now, Kelly said, <laughs> bury me in the ground when I can't drink coffee. Same, I could, girl. Same. I, I think my dad might be able to make it a day without coffee. He drinks <laughs> coffee with everything. Morning right before bed he's drinking coffee he's done it since he was a teenager maybe even earlier and he's used to it yeah coffee is coffee is important i have been getting more on the on the track of doing i'll do one cup of caffeinated and then i'll do a cup of decaf coffee just to help prevent like too much caffeine especially if i want like my 11 my 11 a.m cup of coffee i'm I, I don't, I just can't risk. I love, I love coffee, but I love sleep more and I will not risk my sleep for coffee. <laughs> okay. So what else we got here? Um, okay. So Deb said, uh, Deb, Deb put in a, a question about vitamin K. Um, vitamin K1 turns into vitamin K2. So I don't need to take a vitamin K2. Is that true? So your gut can help with that conversion and creation of K2. If you have, a, there's like a lot of contingencies. If you have a healthy gut that is able to produce it. Um, and so it is possible that you don't need to take a, a vitamin K2. But if you're taking a vitamin D supplement, nine times out of 10, 
I'm looking at a D3 plus a K2. I rarely, rarely do just a D3 because if you're taking in more of that vitamin D, I really wanna help make sure that we've got that adequate K2 to help control and balance that calcium. Um, and that's becoming, I would say, more of a standard. So it, I, and I don't know the whole story, so I'm making a lot of assumptions, but it could be that your doctor was just saying, oh, vitamin K2 by itself, you don't need, or they're saying your, your vitamin D, you don't, you don't need a supplement, so you don't need to worry about any of that. Um, but you know, if there was a vitamin D supplement, I would really, really be looking at K2 as well. And I, there's, there's good research out there to support that. So open up that conversation with the doctor about what kind of research he's seen. <laughs> you know, you can always challenge your practitioner about what their recommendations are and what kind of evidence they have that supports that. Um, because that that's important for them to be able to provide too. And my dad chimed in and said he started drinking coffee at age six and he takes his coffee medium chew. <laughs> I don't know. Do I want to know what that means? It's just, it's pure black. There is nothing yeah. added, you know, oh. light on the water. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. So like basically a, like espresso that, that yeah. thick. Yeah. Oh, uh, he, he just drinks coffee, loves coffee. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a lot. Um, Okay, so let's see. Uh, and we're getting close to the top of the hour, so there'll only be time yeah. for a few more questions. Um, okay. There's some there's some that I think we've kind of already answered from the other from the other conversations and other things we've talked about. So um if you're just jumping in asking questions, definitely be sure to watch the replay because we covered a lot. We're covering a lot in this one. Uh, we cover ice cream. Leanne agrees with my dad. <laughs> you got someone on that team then. Oh, yeah. I'm the one that has to add stuff, and I've learned to be careful because the sugar, the phosphorus, it can add up real quick like you're mentioning. Okay, so Kim mentioned her sodium's always low, and I know she mentioned that earlier on here. How could she increase her sodium? Okay, yeah, let's do that one. Um, so sodium has in part to do with our fluid balance. And if we're retaining fluid, that can dilute the sodium in our body. So think about it like if you made Kool-Aid as a kid or even like the like lemonade or crystal light, maybe people are familiar with, you have a certain amount of water to add per packet. And if you put too much water in with that same packet, it's going to look a lot clearer. It's not going to have, have the same taste because you diluted it. So if you have fluid retention issues, that can lower your sodium because you have more water that you're holding on to that's diluting the sodium. So that's one situation that could be the case of a low sodium. So it's really, really important to talk with your doctor in those events because it might also come with like high blood pressure um, that it's creeping up with that extra fluid. Um, another potential option, and I do see this quite, I wouldn't say a lot, but frequently enough, is that you're not actually eating enough salt. And salt, we do talk about a low sodium diet, but if you are focusing on eating more plants, eating more whole foods, eating less processed foods, you might not actually be getting enough salt in your diet because those kinds of foods are very, very low, if not completely erased in salt. There's really not enough salt there. And salt is a very important mineral for our bodies. It helps with nerve conduction and muscle function. So we do need salt and we lose some salt through sweat and through body movements and all kinds of things. And we want to make sure we get enough of it. So very, very often do I hear people say that they're on like a no, I mean, James, you have a story. You're no sodium diet. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So as soon as I got out of the ICU, I'm like zero sodium, cut it all out. And I remember my wife, she tried her best to make me some, some chili with no sodium. Oh, oh, that was awful. But I ended up having problems. These, my, these pains in my muscles and my arms and stuff. And it didn't take long. And I went to the doctor and he did labs. He goes, Your sodium's too low. That was the problem. Too little yeah. sodium. And that's when I realized it's all about balance. And I like to think about it. And maybe this will help a lot of people out there. 
Think of your health and your diet. It's like a road. And you want to drive down that nice, smooth, freshly paved road. No bumps at all. Oh, that is awesome. When you're missing something in your diet, that starts creating a pothole. If you're really missing a lot of it, it's a big pothole. And those are rough on your car. So you adjust your diet or your doctor may recommend a supplement to tell you which one and how much to take to fill in that pothole so we can get back to that smooth road. But if you take supplements you don't need or you're taking too much of the supplements that you, you did need, you're creating speed bumps, which are just as bad. You can't be driving down the freeway at 70 miles an hour, hitting potholes and speed bumps and expecting everything to be okay. So I yeah. kind of... That's how I think of it all. And you use your diet to help keep that road ahead of you nice and smooth so you can keep going. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's ex exactly the point of, of, you know, just because we think that we need to have a lower amount of something doesn't automatically mean that it's going to be the answer or the solution to the problem. So that, yeah, it could be that. Again, doing a diet recall, doing some food tracking for a while, see how much sodium you're taking in can be really, really insightful. And that can, might provide you some ideas of how to kind of make some changes and track those changes. Very, very helpful. All right, let's do one last question. I'm sorry, everybody, but we do have to eventually end our conversations together. <laughs> we'll do it again. Don't worry. Maybe next month there'll be another Q&A. Yeah, and, and well, you do Q&As in the Facebook group too, which is great. Yeah, yeah. every week we're, we're having questions. We post questions and, and answers and uh, send in the links. Um, so someone said, um, someone said, can someone eat too much fruits, vegetables and fruits where it becomes damaging to the kidneys? Any recommendations on portions? I mean... Too much is very subjective. I was just talking with some students today about aiming for eight to 10 servings per day, which is kind of like the, the standard goal of healthy eating. And not many people get that many. Um, I'm honestly pleasantly surprised when I have a client that can do 10 plus servings per day of fruits and vegetables consistently. That's the key, consistently. Mm -hmm. It's not just like you do that one day and everything's good to go. Um, so the... Can, I, I would suppose the consideration I would make for potentially damaging is if you do have a potassium restriction and not necessarily that we need to limit how much you get, but we need to make choices on like the lower potassium side because there's plenty of low potassium fruits and vegetables. And I still, even for my people with, with potassium restrictions, we still focus on getting plenty of potassium because again, not enough potassium, very, very dangerous for us as well. So um, generally, if you can start with, let's say, five servings a day, so aim for three servings of vegetables and two servings of fruit, and a serving is a cup of raw or a half a cup of cooked, okay, those are the servings, or if you're talking about juice, which I'm not crazy about, but if, you know, if you're making steps, four ounces of juice, which is not much, really, really not much, um, but that would be a serving, and aim for five servings a day. And then do that for like two weeks. And then the next two weeks, go for six servings a day. Add on one more serving of vegetables. And then do that for a couple of weeks. And then add another serving of fruits for another couple of weeks. Like slowly start to add more in. And maybe five a day is too much. Maybe you're really working on getting three a day. You're just trying to get one serving in each meal. That's totally fine. Wherever you're at is the starting point and adding just wherever that is plus one. And that is the goal to get one more serving in because whatever you're going to do in that improvement is going to be helpful for your kidneys. Awesome. All right. Well, that brings us to the very top of the hour. We thought we would do this for 30 minutes. We ran for an hour, but That's I'm all right. happy. It's fine. we got more questions. In we got, yeah, we had a lot of great questions, so it's good. Yeah. So I want to encourage everyone. The links are in the description. Make sure you join the Plant Powered Kidneys Facebook group. Visit the plantpoweredkidneys.com website. Lots of great blog posts by Jen and her team to help you. There's a lot of things people asked about that we weren't able to get to that are discussed on her site. It has a wonderful search. You can go in there and search. 
We've also done a lot of videos in the past about a lot of these topics. If you go to dadvicetv.com, go in the search, type in something like vitamins. You'll see the videos we've done on vitamins, coffee, milk. We did a whole video talking about the different kinds of milks and, and how much you would think that it couldn't be done. You would think like, who would talk about milk for so long? Oh, I, I will. I will talk about it. (laughs) Yeah. We talked all about it. Um, so there's lots and lots of great resources out there. And I want to thank you, Jen, for your time. This has been wonderful. And I want to thank everyone out there for joining us. I will be back next week on Monday with Dr. Rosansky. I can't remember what we're talking about, but it's always good stuff. It's going to be great, (laughs) whatever it is. Thank you so much. And I'll see all of you in the next video. Bye, everyone.